Virginia is for Chevy lovers, at least it is this weekend, as we visit Classic Chevy International's Virginia Beach 96 in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Classic Chevy International is an organization dedicated to the car that has become the symbol of America in the 1950s, the 55 through 57 Chevrolet. As is our custom, we'll show you some of these beautiful cars later on in the program. But first, our Classic Designers and Engineers feature this week is about Fred Goodell, the man Ford Motor Company sent over to Shelby American in the mid-60s to help Carroll mass-produce the legendary Shelby Mustang. The list of projects Fred Goodell has been involved in is enough to stagger the imagination. A boyhood friend of Henry Ford II, Goodell began working for Ford Motor Company in 1934 while completing his mechanical engineering degree at the University of Detroit. He worked directly for Edsel Ford and spent the better part of a year developing a groundbreaking rear engine car that Fred hoped would be a future production model. But at Ford in those days, nothing was produced until the old man, Henry Ford, said so. Fred still remembers the day Henry and Etzo walked into the shop to review the car's chassis design. They left, after looking five minutes maybe they left, and <laughs> Mr. Crawford called me on the telephone. He said, how long have you been working on that car? I said, for a year. He said, how long will it take you to scrap it? Disillusioned by this, Goodell left Ford to become a commercial pilot, and in 1942, he joined the Army Air Corps. After leaving the military, he was between jobs when he bumped into Henry Ford II in a restaurant. And Henry says, well, why don't you, uh, why don't you come back to Ford? I said, uh -uh, that place is too nuts for me. I'm never going back. He said, well, look, I know something that my grandfather and my father didn't know. I don't know anything about the automobile business, but I know how to hire people that do, and I'm going to listen to them. Goodell returned to Ford and rose to chief engineer of the International Division. It was in this capacity that he developed a Falcon with a V8 engine. Ford later marketed the car in the U.S. as a Falcon Sprint. He was also instrumental in the design of the original Mustang, as it used the same underbody as the Falcon. In 1966, Ford requested Goodell move to Shelby American as chief engineer because Shelby was having problems mass-producing the new Shelby Mustang. He was initially contacted by Jack Passano, Ford's head of racing. He declined, and the next day he received a telephone call from Don Fry, vice president and general manager of the Ford division. He said, I want you to go out to California and take a look at the Shelby operations. And I said, no, I'm not interested, Don. I told Passano that yesterday. He says, a little more serious than that, he says, Mr. Henry Ford II wants you to go. Goodell still resisted, but eventually he was convinced to review Carroll Shelby's operation for one week in order to find a way to increase production figures. It didn't take him long to spot the problem. Here you are, you've been in production for three months and you made car number 17 this afternoon. If you're going to make 4,000 cars this year, you've got to make a lot more than that. And the problem is they're not all alike. You're hand fitting everything and you can't do that. So you don't have time to do that. Goodell finally accepted a position at Shelby. He participated in the design of the GT350 and GT500, including prototypes like the Green Hornet, the Super Snake, and Little Red, the car that inspired the California Special Mustang. He also contributed to the design of racing cars like the GT40 Mark II and Mark IV. Goodell retired from Ford in 1974, and today he owns his own engineering consulting business. Fred Goodell, savior of the Shelby Mustang, and a classic engineer. Wandering around classic Chevy International's Virginia Beach 96 reminds me of the importance of preserving our automotive history for car enthusiasts yet to be born. America has a rich automotive tradition that's being threatened by pending legislation in several states that if made law would all but destroy our heritage. The legislation, known as clunker laws in some areas, would among other things mandate the destruction of older cars. As a fellow car nut, I urge you to contact your state and federal representatives to see if there's any legislation pending in your area. It may take the collective voice of the millions of us that love the automobile to stop this ridiculous legislation. Now, I'll get off my soapbox and we'll go take a look at some of these classic 55 through 57 Chevys. So Frank, when did Virginia Chevy Lovers get formed? We were first formed in 1974 as the Virginia Nomad Association, but in 1977 expanded to include uh, all of the uh, 55 through 57 Chevys. How'd you come to uh, host this big event? 
We started on that process about three years ago and uh, petitioned CCI after our membership uh, supported the idea and submitted a proposal to CCI uh, for their acceptance. And what do you think of the event this year? Uh, the event's been uh, tremendous. Everybody has uh, just had a great time. Uh, we've had to deal with Hurricane Bertha, but uh, I think everybody has totally enjoyed themselves and we've had a great turnout of cars and people. So Joe, how'd you come to choose Virginia Beach for this year's event? Virginia Chevy Lovers is the local CCI chapter here in this area. Those folks approached us several years ago about doing a Eastern Regional here. We were in need of someone to actually host an international on the coast, so I discussed it with them and they said, sure, we'd love to do it. Paul, a 55 Nomad, pretty rare car. How many of these were made? 8,500. Wow. Now, one of the interesting things about this car was actually the model for the Danbury Mint, Mint model, which you have on your hood right here. Right. Now, they, they came to you to, to photograph this and everything? Yes. How long did that take? It took all day. Three, three guys from a design studio up in New Jersey. And uh, they took over $800 worth of pictures, had it on a lift out in the yard, would set up camera measurements for distance shots and different other stuff. That's something. We got Jim Ledbetter here from Tennessee with a beautiful, sleek 56. Jim, she's a beauty. One of the unique things about the 56, and I guess the 57 too, is, is where you put the gas in these cars. Show me, show me how the gas goes in this baby. Yes, you put gas into your gas tank through the tail light assembly. And that was unique for the 1956. She's got a locking gas cap. That's it has a locking gas cap also, which was a, uh, a factory option at the time. Another factory option that's kind of unique is this Continental kit. Don't see many of those. No, it was a fairly expensive item uh, in 1956. And of course, the Continental kit is for your spare tire, but it's entered on the back of the vehicle, and it bolts into your bumper assembly. Our feature this week is a repeat of one of our most popular stories. Some of you may remember our face-to-face -face matchup of old Trans Am racing rivals, the Boss 302 Mustang and the Z28 Camaro. The rivalry between the Boss 302 Mustang and the Z28 Camaro is one of the most colorful in the history of Ford versus Chevy. Not only did they compete for customers, they competed for the checkered flag as well. The street versions of these small block screamers continue to appreciate because of their performance, aggressive looks, and SCCA Trans Am racing history. Like any great duo, each would not have achieved this level of popularity without the other. What really makes these cars unique is their racing history. Each won the prestigious Trans Am Championship when factory support was at its peak. The Z28 in 1968 and 69 and the Boss 302 in 1970. We spent a beautiful autumn weekend at Road Atlanta during the SVRA's Atlanta Vintage Grand Prix and Trans Am Reunion to take an up-close look at these two legendary race cars. This three-day event is just one of a growing number of vintage events held across the country. Well, Glory Days is a, a tour of the historic Trans Am cars, the late 60s and early 70s. It's organized by Historic Auto Racing Events Incorporated in conjunction with the uh, SVRA, and we're back here to recreate the, the feeling of the late 60s and early 70s. The driving in the Trans Am cars in those days was very much more seat of the pants, and I guess the cars were, uh, one of the reasons it was so good is that all the cars were so competitive, you know, and all of the manufacturers were interested because this meant big sales for all of them. For our look at a Boss 302, we chose this car. A 70 Boss built by Bud Moore as a backup during Ford's 70 championship season. The car was actually driven during the 71 season by Peter Gregg. The Z28 parked in the garage next door is a Roger Penske car driven by none other than Mark Donahue when he won the 69 Trans Am Championship. Both cars have been restored to their original race condition. We asked their current owners, Ken Epsman and Fred Galloway, how they became interested in owning a piece of Trans Am history. Ever since I was a kid, I always wanted to have a 1968 Shelby GT500 convertible. I eventually got one. I took it to an open track event at Sears Point Raceway in 1984 and was hooked ever since. How about you, Brett? Started street racing and quit dur during college. And when I got out of college, I met a couple of fellows that introduced me to vintage racing and went to the track and got completely hooked. Now I, got to own it. I asked Fred to explain some of the Penske sure. Z28's unique features that helped Donahue win the 69 championship. He started under the hood with Chevrolet's famous cross-ram manifold and dual four-barrel carbs. This combination gave the Z28 a slight horsepower advantage over the Boss 302 during the 69 season. Fred then pointed out two very clever Penske innovations. The fueling system was very unique. They had a large tower 
that the fuel came down, they put dry ice in it to cool it so, the, so you could get basically 24 gallons of fuel in a 22 gallon fuel cell. They would come in and hit this door and fill it and the gas would, would, would blow in. An interesting thing is, is when you look underneath, you can see that, that the filler actually will hold another four gallons. Amazing. So they, they could get quite a bit of gas in, 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 in a very short time. They were getting about 24 gallons of fuel in 3.2 seconds. That's pretty clever. So it made a very, very fast pit stop for them for gas. The changes that they made to the, to the business office, and that was for the oil, they, they could add oil in here through a pressurized can that they just gave to Donahue, so he was able to add oil during the pit stop. So he was part of the pit crew too? Correct. They also had switches that, that if somebody followed Donahue repeatedly too close into a corner, he could turn off his lights. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they would never know where his breaking point was. Bit of an unfair advantage, but... <laughs> Ken then showed me a couple of the unique of features on his Bud Moore prepared Boss 302. The flares on the fenders were enlarged a half an inch and the inner fender wheel wells were moved in three inches to make room for larger tires. A huge chin spoiler was added for downforce. The Boss 302 was one of the first Trans Am cars to take advantage of aerodynamic aids. Ken then lifted the hood and showed me a major reason Ford won the 70 championship. Well, this, this, this motor differed mainly with this mini plenum intake system. This is a single four barrel but this air was forced in through this pipe and it, it pressurized inside the air, basically the air cleaner area, and it forced the air and basically like a, a supercharger with no, with no belts. Squeeze out a few more horsepower. That's right. After our close-up look at the cars, we asked Fred and Ken if they'd take the two Trans Am champions out on the track so we could photograph them. They jumped at the chance to have Road Atlanta's 2.5 miles of scenic beauty to themselves. Thanks guys for the awesome sight of brilliantly painted sheet metal flashing by and the sweet sound of screaming V8s echoing through the trees.